consultant and commentator on geo geopolitical issues and strategic and strategic issues. Um, you're going to be commenting commenting Jonathan Friedland, journalist, alias Sam Bourne, and and on the long view, except I think this is now not the long view, but the immediate view. And Rabbi Shoshana Boyd Gelfand, um, leader, leadership development, um, leading with the Pairs Foundation, in particular international grants and international relations. All three of you reflecting on the reflections of Anne Applebaum, Timothy Snyder, and Yuval Noah Harari. And I've given, I've asked to return at the end to the practical, although this isn't a practice, this is a reflective opportunity. I've asked Ruti Amal, who's been very, very involved, who's got experience of living in Russia, who knows the Ukraine well, to just give a closing word, reminding us of what it is that we can do. But before we do anything else, I just wanted to give the opportunity, and it's something, uh, Rabbi Shoshana, you said this is important, just literally in one word, if people want a moment to put, put into the chat just what it is that you're feeling at the moment. And I'll just reflect on some of the words that come up. Just literally in a, in a word, if people put something in the chat and I'll, I'll be following it now. So the words vary from anger, horrified, devastated, fear, depressed, to powerless, and then also to determination. And actually there's something of that determination that comes across in what we are about to see. Um, I share personally a lot of that sense of powerless, powerlessness and helplessness, but there's something of I think determination, and I don't know whether I can use the word, even hope for the world in the courage that we're seeing before us. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to, we have on YouTube the extract and Rivka's kindly you know, looking after the tech for us. You're going to um, show that now, and then I'll reintroduce our guests and we'll open the discussion. Whole, the whole, of the whole YouTube and we should thank Stand for Ukraine and Anne Applebaum, Yuval Noah Harari and Timothy Snyder for that outstanding discussion, which was full of words that deeply moved me, becoming a personal force oneself, that it's not about fate, ultimately it's about individual choice. Um, and that the this is it, the moment of truth is now. And to reflect on that from among us, I really appreciate Jonathan Friedland that you're joining us and many of us follow what you have to write in, in The Guardian and elsewhere. I hear you many times on the long view, but this is now the immediate view, it's now. Um, and Haggai, on, you're an internationally acclaimed expert on, on geopolitics, and I think I'm gonna begin with you in a moment. And Rabbi Shoshana Boyd Gelfand, friend, colleague and leader, in international affairs, international development, and with above all in a deep perspective we talked earlier today on the Jewish, the Jewish resonance of all of this. So I'm going to begin by asking each of you a leading question and asking you to take two, three, two, three, four minutes in reflecting on it. Agai um, Yuval Noah Harari used the, used the phrase, said of Putin, he has no expectations and that um, this leads us back to an era of war. This frightens us very deeply. Can you set the perspective to that? And you know, the geohistorical perspective to that, sort of like asking you for Torah on one leg, I realize, and, and perhaps, uh, perhaps comment on it. And then I'm going to come to you, Jonathan, with a question about, you know, the, the undoing the moral and linguistic structure of our, of our age. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and um, pleasure uh, to be sharing the platform again with the other Jonathan and with Shoshana again. Um, yeah, look, impossible to do in the time available. Let, let, let me say a couple of things. And, and with everyone sharing words like hopeless and depressed, let me try and concentrate on where actually there are some very positive signs 
on the slightly longer view of the horrific events that we are seeing playing out. Um, it's really interesting, this thing about Nazification, because um, why is it that in the Russian imagination, um, Putin believes he needs to talk about Nazis? Well, the two world wars were incredibly different experiences for Russians. They don't want to remember World War One, but they like celebrating World War Two. Now, that's despite the fact that tens of millions of them died in the defense of the country. But it was seen as a glorious national effort against an, an unquestionably legitimate enemy. And what's really fascinating about this is, is that why World War I is avoided is that a unpopular, autocratic, out of touch leader took his country into a war that the people wanted nothing to do with, which very quickly not just resulted in his own soldiers refusing to fight and fraternizing with the enemy, but within four months resulted in the beginning of what became the Russian Revolution. And what is very interesting is that this is why there is now such an effort, not just from within Ukraine, but also within Russia to, to challenge that Nazi narrative, because it is, it is rewriting history. But on this idea that dictators always tend to make the same mistakes, he's actually slight, while, while terribly keen to look like he's a great leader, uh, you know, who leads his country as happened in World War II, he's actually sliding himself into the scenarios that are around in World War One, And what's really interesting about the current strategic situation is that this is all happening through weakness. Russia has been sidelined in not just the 20 years of relative uni power under the United States, but as importantly, they are a peripheral player in what is the next Cold War, which is US-China. And this is Putin's desperate attempt as somebody who, and this so often happens with dictators, is uh, all that matters is, is his personal prestige as, as a way of keeping control within a state that's so large and so diverse and has so much potential to, to you know, potentially to challenge his authority is, is, to, is to play the classic muscle flexing uh, nationalist card. But Russians are not that stupid. Russians are connected to the rest of the world. And what is also so important is that when this started 12 days ago, I, like uh, Hariri, was up at night. But I have to tell you that I am now watching with increased optimism as to what's going on now. Not optimism about Ukraine, not optimism about Ukrainians. In fact, quite the opposite, because all Putin has got is brutality. And I'm afraid on the ground for people in Ukraine, it's going to be horrible, as it was in Chechnya, as it was in Syria. The appalling performance of the Russian military, because then they don't have sophisticated capacity, sadly means they just use the indiscriminate brutal tactics. And I'm afraid we're going to see it in the next few weeks. However, as was emphasized at the end of that video, what it has done is reminded people in the West who have got utterly complacent about democracy, that democracy is not passive. You know, I give my students a quote, which is, you may not take an interest in politics, but politics will take an interest in you. And I asked them when they think it was said. And you know, you get 1970, 1990. Students think they're really clever, say the 1800s. It was said in ancient Greece. And the minute you disengage from democracy, the minute you say, I, you know, uh, who cares if only 30% of people vote? It, what's it got to do with me? That's when democracy crumbles. You know, and John Adams, one of the founding fathers, famously said that every democracy commits suicide. And what, you, and, what, and what I take by that as a modern reader is, is it's passivity. And what, in, to some extent, the election of Donald Trump started within America, but as mentioned there, what Ukraine has forced everybody to do in Europe, and yet they're the ones being sacrificed for it, is that the idea that we live in a liberal democratic world is not a given. Um, uh, but also what is wonderful is that we have seen that it actually is something that people profoundly believe in and are willing to fight for. And the situation in Germany that was mentioned is absolutely remarkable. The decisions made in the last week are the most significant constitutional decisions that Germany has made since it emerged from the Nazi era, even before unification. And what they have said is we are determined to drive a modern Europe and not just the European Union, the wider idea of Europe. That, that includes Britain significantly, um, a Europe which believes in these values and is not going to allow uh, a return to the kind of dynamics that, that we saw in World War II. Um, 
The last point, gonna, though, go on, last go point on, sorry. is that the last 16 years, according to one of the um, think tanks that look at this, the last 16 years, e each year, we've seen more dictatorship and less democracy in the world. Indeed, The Economist, some of you have seen a few weeks ago, now has this grade of countries in the world of their democratization. America sits just in flawed democracy. And countries like Turkey, Russia, are now in what they call hybrid regimes. Um, democracy is not um, growing, it's diminishing. It's, called, it's referred to in academic discourse as democratic deficit. But the reality is, is that this crisis may have shocked people again into realizing that Europe is built on these ideas. And earlier in that video, they talked about the fact that Ukrainians, and this is why they are, them fighting is so important, they chose a few years ago a civic democracy rather than an ethnic democracy. This is a place where, yes, there might be some neo-Nazis, but an, a Jew can be elected president because people have said we want a nationalism that is based on our own internal positive values, not on a default external engagement negatively militarily with our neighbors. And when we're attacked, we are willing, be it boxers, comedians or expats and coming back, to fight for those values. They're fighting for democracy. They're not just fighting for their country. And so as horrific as what is going on is, it, in many ways, when it was desperately needed, has reinvigorated democracy and it has reinvigorated European democracy. And Russia now, if this was supposed to be part one of invading other countries, it has massively, massively changed the paradigm and changed the decision-making. And by the way, it put China in an incredibly difficult position, which they do not like, which is also making it much less likely that they'll follow this up and do this in Taiwan. And I'm happy to be challenged on that premise and talk a, bit, a little bit more later on that if people are interested. Yes, I'm aware that we're having this conversation in the month of Adar, which technically Adar HaSheni, which includes Purim, the references to the battle with Amalek, and the, you know, the Jewish understanding that there are things for which one needs to fight. And I'm going to come to, to you with that shortly, Rabbi Shoshana. But meanwhile, Jonathan, among the phrases that Timothy Snyder used, he was, he, he, knows, he commented on the perversion of the language of the Holocaust, you know, talking about Putin's you know, a, attack on the Nazi state, which has a Jewish president. You've written on to kill a president this is about to kill a Jewish president. And he says, undoing the linguistic and the moral structures. You're a person who very much works with language. There's a question here of truth and lies, of the perversion of language. And, and this, is, this is being fought at the, at the level of the most brutal weaponry, but it's also being fought at the level of language and ideas. And I'd like to hear your comments on that, Jonathan. You're muted at the moment. Thank you. And um, I echo what Haggai said about uh, it being good to be with you all, with you, Rabbi Jonathan and Rabbi Shoshana and you, Haggai, and everyone watching. Uh, it's funny because I, I've been wondering whether my own interest in the question you've just asked was slightly kind of parochial, you know, finding the Jewish angle on this horrible global event. And some of you may know, I do a podcast called Unholy with uh, the anchor of Israeli television news, Yonit Levy. And we've been talking about the local angle, how Israel sits on this, how Jews sit on it, and with some guilt because it seemed self-interested and peripheral. As it's turned out, it's got further and further towards the center of events to the point where it was the prime minister of Israel who is apparently playing this shuffle diplomacy role this weekend, spending three hours, I think, with Vladimir Putin and having three separate conversations with President Zelensky. So the parochial angle is not wholly parochial, but the deeper point is the one that Timothy Snyder got to. And that is this, he, both Putin sees it and Zelensky sees it. And it's strange to realize that us, and I mean my us Jews, play this very central role in the imagination of both countries and in the wider world. And so when Vladimir Putin wants to justify the operation, the language he reaches for is denazification and talks about Israel, uh, Ukraine being run by neo-Nazis and fascists. Untrue, obviously. We'll get onto the untruth in a second. But interesting that that's the card he felt he had to play, both in terms of bringing along Russian public opinion, 
but also getting a kind of some kind of seal of approval from international opinion. I think it goes to a very interesting understanding of Russia and its place, which is that, you know, what, what is the one bit of moral authority Russia has in the, again, in the global imagination? You know, we associate with totalitarianism, we associate it with the famine in Ukraine, with the massive uh, slaughter of kulaks, we associate it with Stalin's gulag, etc. We go forward to roll tanks rolling into Budapest in 56 and in Prague in 68, Afghanistan in 79. And that's even before you get to Putin's record in Chechnya and Syria and Georgia and everything. The one bit of moral authority Russia still has is that it was Russia that defeated Hitler. It was the Red Army, not the British Army or the American Army, that liberated Auschwitz. It's the one thing he has. And therefore, that's what he reached for. He understood how important that was for the reason that Snyder says, which is when people go on about the post-1945 moral world order, that is, as Timothy Snyder says, built on the understanding that the ultimate, the sort of terminus case for immoral behavior is the Shah. And that the, never, the 1945 international order can be summarized as never again. That's what it was for in two words. And so whether we like it or not, we're really in this thing um and then on the other side of the coin Zelensky understood this too and so and it puzzled me Zelensky has got the backing of everyone in the world right everyone backs him he's the, he's the global hero of the hour the EU back in the US back in every country the General Assembly of the United Nations and yet he kept on issuing this plea Jews of the world I want your support uh Israel where are you and that's because Israel has got itself into this weird position of uh, neutrality, um, where my co-host on Unholy, Yonit Levy, says they have to choose between dad and evil stepdad because they need America's backing, but they can't anger Putin because Putin allows them a free hand in Syria. Uh, Zelensky understood it as well. So he wants the Jews to be loud and clear in their support of Ukraine. And for Jews, older ones especially, it's quite difficult because we have some memories of Ukraine's less than exemplary record during the Holocaust. Uh, where there were obviously large instances, many instances of collaboration. So I say all that just because, you know, this is a synagogue audience and, and we're not detached from this. The two main protagonists in this drama think we're right in the middle of it in terms of our uh, history um, and our record. Um, in terms of truth, because I know that's actually what you asked me, Jonas, um, we are up against something really, uh, a phenomenon here for all the reasons Haggai said, um, which is, uh, you know, it is an empire of lies that Vladimir Putin has built up. And it's not without precedent, because obviously uh, the Nazis did the same thing. But for his uh, Rush, modern Russia's main export to the world is, is constant lies and disinformation and the particular idea of post-truth, which has this notion that it's more than just a lie. Post-truth is this idea that the truth itself is impossible to get at. It's elusive. You'll never get there. And so, you know, when Russia downed the, the jet MH17, you know, Putin would say on TV, who knows? We know He wouldn't say necessarily we didn't do it. He would just say, I don't think we're ever going to find out. We'll never know. The truth is impossible. You know, Trump used to echo that. Trump's favorite phrase was always, nobody knows. Nobody knows what happened with that. You know, wanting people to be confused and you're getting that now uh, with a whole, it's taken in a way what we, and this is the last thing I'll say because there's more to say about other things. But what we're seeing now is the culmination of Putinism for 20 plus years. We cannot say we weren't warned in two respects. First, the total dishonesty of it, lying to the people of Russia and saying, the country next door is run by neo-Nazis and fascists, total lie. They're going to welcome you like liberators, lie, um, etc. That's, the, that's this is the ultimate demonstration case but also <coughs> pardon me it's the combination of putinism because he has been doing this for 20 years he took a bite out of georgia in 2008 he took crimea in 2014 and he made the most murderous slaughter by assad of his own people in syria he made that war Russia's own. I mean, that war, I said, is in place because of Putin. And it's, it's Russian pilots who've been fighting that dirty, squalid 
murderous war. And the world just shrugged. And in 2018, the world went to Moscow and Russia for the World Cup. We said, fine, no problem. So what possible conclusion could he have drawn except to think, I'll roll into Ukraine and they'll, they'll pass the old resolution and there'll be the, an op-ed in the New York Times and in the Guardian and then they'll just come and celebrate the Winter Olympics or whatever I choose to host next. So this is the culmination of it and we can't pretend to be surprised by it. We gave the green light to it again and again and again and he would have, Putin, would have in some ways a perverse right to say, why are you getting so upset now? I'm only doing what I've always been doing and you've been fine with it. I'm doing to Kharkiv what I already did to Aleppo and you shrugged, you went to the World Cup. What's the problem? So that's my slightly bleaker take on it. I'm going to ask everybody after, I'm going to come to Shanta, everybody at that, 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 that line from Yuval Noah Harari, this is it the moment of truth and how you would how you'd understand that. Uh, just before, just while I was waiting to let people, we were waiting to let people in, a headline from Haaretz flashed up that actually Russia had actually opened a fire on demonstrators in Russia, which is a, another horrible, right. but not surprising development. And at what cost suppressing truth? Um, Rabbi Shoshana, um, pacifism is the wrong lesson from history from Timothy Snyder and Yuval Noah Harari. Um, and at what point Judaism, which concludes every prayer with the prayer, O say shalom, God makes peace. At what time is that not what one has to do? And I, what do you see here? We're coming up to Purim and so on. What do you see here you know, from a point of view of how must we be as Jews? Well, thank you for that question, because I was shaking in my boots here a little bit in that I, I, I'm not a geopolitician, I'm not a historian, I'm, I'm um, listening intently to everyone on the video and to Haggai and Jonathan, and thank you so much for those, those insights. Um, I think what, what I can bring to the table here is just to remind us that um, this is Parshat Zahor this week. We are, we are commanded to go to synagogue on Shabbat. And, and to read the words, you know, remember what Amalek did to you on the way. Um, and um, this is, as, as you say, you know, Judaism, we, we pray for peace. Of course we want peace. It's what Yuval Harari was saying at the end of that clip there. But we are not a pacifist tradition and we are taught to remember Amalek. And what is it that Amalek did that was so horrific? Um, the, the notion that Amalek attacked those who were weak. You know, what you just said about attacking protesters, peaceful protesters, that is an Amalek type of behavior. Um, attacking and cutting off humanitarian corridors for women, children, those who are ill, um, that is Amalek type behavior. And it's something that makes me uncomfortable. I mean, maybe that's why we get drunk on Purim, right? Because it, it makes me very uncomfortable to um, feel like I'm someone who's warmongering by remembering Amalek and constantly being vigilant about Amalek. But that's the resonance that I was hearing during that, um, that video was, um, one second. Um, that's what I was hearing during that video was this sense of, of needing to remember um, that there are times when we have to fight. Um, and that is um, something that we are enjoined to do as Jews. And yet at the same time, and this is what was so striking to me of what's going on now, um, people are, are coming together and standing with the Ukrainians and saying, we are going to fight against, a, against tyranny, against despotism. And at the same time, holding on to compassion and loving the stranger. The number of people who have said, I want to welcome these refugees into my home. UK government, give them a visa and I will put them in my spare bedroom. To be able to hold on to both of those at the same time, I think is a very Jewish thing 
to be able to say, I'm going to fight against Amalek and I'm not going to harden my heart. I'm going to open my doors to those who deserve my compassion, those who are weak, those who are struggling in the end. And so I feel like during this time leading up to Purim, the Purim story is alive and well. Um, that as we go through this time of Purim, we are going to be reading the story of a tyrant, someone who didn't listen to his advisors, some a dictator who made mistakes and couldn't admit it. Um, we're going to be seeing this story through the lens of um, our Jewish particularity. And the one message that I can give is that if you recall the war against Amalek, Moshe would hold up his hands. And when he held up his hands, the Israelites would prevail against Amalek. And when we put his hands down, they didn't. And so it was Aaron and her who held up his arms. And in a sense, that's the question for us, is how can we help hold up the arms of those Ukrainians who are fighting against Amalek? And I know we'll get to that at the end. I know Ruti is going to talk about that. But for me, that is the, the burning question right now. What can I do to help the Ukrainians be their Aaron and their her and hold up their arms? Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Shoshana. Um, this, this is so part of where we are in the Jewish year and where we are in our, where we are in our history. And we are going to come. I'm going to take about another 10 minutes for reflection and then the last five minutes this is I said at the beginning this is reflective space what does this mean there's also the need to act so we're going to come back to just in the very closing minutes with um, Ruti and myself about what it is that we can we can do particularly with that sense of helplessness which was expressed in the chat and which I, I so very much share just before coming back to everybody this is brought back to mind and unfortunately I can only read them in English and not in Russian but some of the great Jewish poets um, Osip Mandelstam, the Stalin epigram, for which he was overheard reading in a public space and arrested and sent into exile where he died in transit, in which he talked about um, ringed, with a, ringed with a circle of half men, none of whom dare contradict Stalin, he alone goes boom. The, the, those lines so, so resonated with what's happening now. Um, a, couple of, a couple of comments from the earlier discussion just to put to each of you and I think this time in a slightly different order I think I'm going to begin with you Jonathan and then Shoshana and then conclude with you Haggai um, a couple of comments um, this is it this is the moment of truth and I'm going to couple that with the comment history is not fate history is about choices and there's a point where one has to make a personal choice how would you read those comments, how do they resonate for you? I'm going to start with you, Jonathan, and then Shoshana, and then Haggai, and then we'll come to Ruti and myself and close. You're muted, Jonathan. Thank you. They definitely did resonate. In fact, they resonated when I first heard them on... Yeah, and yes, I uh, thanked you right at the beginning for putting me... No, no, I know you did, yeah, and it was, it was just serendipity you happened to sort of text me at the moment that thing was beginning and I said you've got to watch this because it was riveting uh I think what what Yuvana Harari meant by <clears throat> and what I take from this is the moment of truth in a way relates to what I was saying before about the multiple warnings we should have acted earlier um we should have drawn the line and realized what was happening with the annexation the seizure of Crimea in 2014 but we didn't so now we are where we are and we have to act now and what i think as i say i take from that is you know of course the optimum is that you always did this yesterday but since you didn't do it yesterday you have to do it now because if you don't and this is the worry one has to have is what conclusion would he draw next i mean he would surely conclude they really will let me get away with anything so next is moldova georgia I mean, he's obviously on some crazed thing about reconstituting the Russian Empire. And so you do have to stop it. Um, and that, in that sense is what I took from this at the moment of truth. We can't duck it. Um, it's very hard when you're dealing with a nuclear power. I don't pretend to know the moral answer to that, because obviously in not acting, 
you risk him invading more and more countries. And in acting, you risk nuclear confrontation. So I, I, I think it's morally the most hideous predicament. Uh, on the other point about inevitability, I think it's so right. And I think the it's about uh, not being passive. There is this, you know, it, I mean, <coughs> I, I can't now remember whether it was Snyder himself who said this, but this trap that with democracy, because it does strike us as the last best hope of mankind kind of thing, like the, 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 the best system that we can find to live in, there's a temptation to think, therefore, there's something um, ultimate about it, or sort of almost concluding about it, that we've reached this moral pinnacle, uh, or, or, or sort of, again, terminus, and therefore, we won't go back. And there's nothing inevitable about that. I noticed in the chat, someone said, freedom is a verb, quoting Daniel Kahn, maybe Kahneman. I don't know who that is. Um, somebody else will know. But uh, that's a good point. The idea you have to fight for it. And you cannot just sit back and think it's going to be fine. And that's why I, I was shared some of her guy's optimism. I feel terrible that it's at the apparent expense of Ukrainian people. But the idea that the West has rediscovered its focus, again, because I'm going to be the guy who's parochial. I was parochially Jewish before. I'm going to be parochially British now. It, it pains me that at the moment where the European Union has proved why it is so necessary and why it was founded, it was founded to be an institution of peace for a conflict that was drenched in blood after two world wars, built on a Jewish insight, by the way, Jean Monnet, that you know, the, the alternative to sharing sovereignty was killing for it. How terrible that our contribution to this, Britain's contribution in the last six years, was to walk away from this venture. I mean, you know, I always used to say I don't care actually about whether this or that, you know, regulation or trade benefit. The point is this is a project for peace and we will undermine it by leaving. And Farage and the others wanted that. They kept on saying, let's hope the whole thing comes crushing down now. That now we know why that was necessary. Now we know why the West is necessary. Now we know why NATO is necessary. My word, we've learned this lesson so late. Um, but we have to, uh, you know, fight actively for those things. Um, and, you know, at the moment, the method is economic warfare. Let's hope that works. Um, but we, these things don't come by themselves, you know, and we can't be passive about them. It feels to me that's a very Jewish teaching anyway, actually, that you don't. You have to remake the world every generation. You know, it's not a sort of new, an inheritance that you can just sit there. Apparently, Daniel Kahn, American Yiddish singer based in Berlin, he has a very poignant song, Freedom is a Verb. That's um, somebody on the chat, Baruria Vigan, said that. So that's very helpful. Anyway, so that's the closing thought. We have to do it ourselves. That's what Moment of Truth means. Now is the moment to act. Yeah. And uh, Rabbi Shoshana and thinks of Maimonides, you know, always think of yourself as on this balancing point between good and bad. Think of the world as in this moment of balance and the individual choice or the collective choice to act or not act is what determines the fate of the world. Um, your reflection on now is the moment and really history is made by personal choices and not by, by an overwhelming sense of fate. I don't have any words of immediate comfort because I think the immediate future is going to be painful. Um, but in thinking a bit more long term on this, this isn't the first time that we have um, sold out to despots because of our hunger for energy, our hunger for oil. Um, and I am hopeful that we can think about this in a way that, that suggests that, that we need to remake a world where number one, we're using less energy and have more renewable sources of energy, but number two, that we don't have to do business with people whose values do not meet our standards. And I think we're on the cusp of that. And I am hopeful that this will, will push us over that edge. Um, and I'm, I'm heartened by, um, I, I, I was actually quite, quite down before Shabbat and I was meeting with my colleague, Sir Trevor Pears, and he shared with me a quote by Gandhi. And it, it did give me perspective. Um, and, and the quote is, uh, Gandhi said, whenever I despair, 
I remember that the way of truth and love has always won. There may be tyrants and murderers, and for a time they may seem invincible, but in the end, they always fall. Thank you. You remind me of something I've been thinking about uh, while all this happens, which is, this is also a huge distraction for the world from its number one problem, which is the survival of, the, of, of life. Um, maybe this will turn us in the right direction. Maybe, let's hope. Can I just add um, to that, please, Jonathan? Please, which, which is, I, I had a, a, an awful note that I had to write to somebody right before Shabbat, which was part of the reason I was so despondent was we were about to, uh, she was about to unfold a, a campaign around global vaccine equity in the States and said, is this the right time to do it? We've been planning it for the past three months, um, but now doesn't seem to be the right moment to be making this appeal. And we agreed that actually it was going to need to be postponed. And that just, I mean, brought me to tears that it's not just through the war, but it's because of the distraction from other very, very urgent issues of getting the vaccine out to Africa, to other, other countries that need it, that is also suffering, um, as is global climate issues, um, while we focus on this issue that is taking up all of the headlines and all of our bandwidth. A quick comment and then over to you, Haggai, which is this, on Monday morning, us uh, rabbis, five of us of the core of Eco Synagogue across all the denominations, were due to meet in Enfield to plant trees. Two of us got there. Rabbi David Mason didn't because he was delivering our objections to the nationality bill signed by a thousand faith leaders to Downing Street. Tanya Sankovic didn't because she was getting herself and her family out of Kiev. And at that point, the night before, she had crossed the border into Moldova and was on her way towards the EU. But we thought we are going to go on planting because we have to act for a different kind of future. And there's such precedent for that in Jewish tradition that one keeps on planting in the face of tyrants. And that leads me to you, Haggai, that comment, truth from the quote from Gandhi, which Rabbi Shoshana brought, truth will always win out. And um, how, can we, uh, how can we help it win out? Um, will it win out in your view? What are the steps? I'm thinking sort of the political scene rather than the immediate sort of personal action which we'll come to in a moment. Yeah, and, and it's amazing during these crises how it actually brings out some of the more remarkable things in the human condition. I was, when Shoshana Sami said about 10 minutes ago, I was reading earlier today an Islamic, British-based Islamic scholar explaining on social media why it was justified that Naftali Bennett flew on Shabbat to Russia. Um, I just love that as an idea. And that that kind of, you know, that's that sense of camaraderie about around common values. Um, what is also really important about connecting something Shoshana just said with what Jonathan said is that, um, and you know, Jonathan said, uh, John Friedland said, it, you know, is, is economic war enough? I, I think we can't underestimate how important the fact that this really for the first time is economic with cultural, with political, with moral. The fact that Russia is being culturally and sportingly isolated I, I know for many it seems peripheral. I can't tell you how important it is. Vladimir Putin has based his prestige on sport. Um, it's, it, it, the doping program is about the fact that when Russia wins lots of gold medals, it means that Putin's running the country properly. They had a World Cup. They had a Winter Olympics. He constantly associates himself with things like the, with, you know, the ballet and the opera. And it, may, it meant a great deal to him that he was made eighth Dan uh, Judo and was this honorary head of the International Judo Association. And what's also important about it is, is when Russia has been stripped of all of this, and it has, you can't hide this from the Russian people with your propaganda because nothing you do on Russian television is, is going to be able to take away from the fact that their teams are not playing in the Champions League and they're not participating at the Winter Olympics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And... It, you know, the fact that the speech made a few days ago about sanctions really shows 
that this is biting. And what it also shows is that this sport washing, whereas Jonathan says, you know, he invades Crimea, everybody shrug shrugs his shoulder and say, well, hey ho, let's watch a World Cup. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe finally, the world is coming to understand that these things are, are, you know, the idea that sport is not political is just a gift to autocrats. He says, as we're about to have a World Cup in Qatar. Um, so, you know, this is, a, you know, and Saudi Arabia is doing an enormous amount of sport washing as well. So this is, this is a, a complex dynamic, but what, what is so interesting is the response has been moral. But the last thing I want to put, bring up point is Jonathan's point about Brexit, and I don't want to get too, you know, sidetracked with it, but a month before the referendum, I found myself at an event having a one hour raving argument with a certain conservative cabinet minister who was a very prominent Brexiteer who not only wasn't willing to accept the premise that the EU was founded to create peace, he didn't even know that's why it had happened. And for those of you who don't know the context, a few years after World War II, the French and the German foreign minister sat down and said, look, the last three wars have been about the fact that we uh, go to war over the same coal fields. If we share them, what we do is we remove the engine of war. And also we can't afford war because the resources split 50-50. The entire premise of the European Union is it was that if you take away nationalist competition, which inevitably leads to war, and you replace it with national cooperation, you remove the engine of conflict from the European continent. That's why they were given the Nobel Peace Prize. Vladimir Putin hates that. He funds far right groups across Europe. Brexit for him was a gift. And what is so interesting, and the good news is, is despite the utter lunacy of Brexit, Britain in some ways. This Britain, you know, Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, etc. These guys are actually been pretty forthright and pretty um, uh, distinctive in the fact that the intellectually and morally they're still part of that order. It's too late to rejoin the EU, probably, um, but it is something that we can all take solace from. That despite the deliberate isolationist tendencies of the people leading this government, who became prime minister and ministers off the back of Brexit. We're seeing a remarkably European, as in the French and the Germans in the 1950s response to this international crisis. And that should give us a lot of confidence that we're simply not gonna watch Russia rampage at Eastern Europe, quite the opposite. Putin is now thinking twice about it. His army isn't capable of doing it and everyone is waiting to respond. And that is a remarkable long-term good news and what is in the short term, a horrific crisis. Thank you. Everyone is waiting to respond. And in the small ways we can, I'll pick up Rabbi Shoshana's phrase, can we support the hands of Aaron, support Aaron and Fur keeping Moses' hands aloft? That's the image that we have from Jewish tradition about Shabbat Zachor in the defeat of Amalek. I'll mention some, albeit small, but I think important things. And then I want to give the last word, a little couple of minutes, we're in our last five minutes now, um, to Ruti. Before I go to the practical, I want to thank, I want to thank Rabbi Shoshana, Jonathan, Haggai. There is so much to think about. There's so much that you've put out there. We can't sort of process it into one message, but we will go on communicating, talking and finding solidarity over the, over the time to come. We're thinking a week's time, possibly Monday week of having uh, a round of Masorti European communities, what people are doing, what people are thinking, what people are, 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 are where people are emotionally, spiritually, morally, and practically. So that may be one of the next things that we do. But I, I, I want to say that the message I'm getting from World Jewish Relief, from the appeals from the deck, from Masorti Olami is that at this point in time, money, funds are what's really, really needed, that actually goods in kind are not what's being asked for, but the funding is absolutely essential. They work with all, with a whole range of organizations working within the Ukraine, beyond the, beyond the Ukraine or around the borders and in the countries receiving the most refugees. So that is absolutely essential. Within our community, that's what we're promoting. But I also want to say that we're beginning to gather in the, in the hope that uh, the prime minister's will fulfill the promise that a significant six-figure number of refugees will be enabled to come to this country, who has got place for hosting, and also who speaks Russian and who speaks Ukrainian. Because as people begin to arrive here as they are, 
we will need to be able to communicate if we're going to be able to do anything as a community. Um, so there are, it feels very helpless, it feels very small. The other thing I want to say is if you have friends, family in the Ukraine, friends in Ukraine, friends who've got friends and family in the Ukraine or indeed in Russia, be in touch. These are unbelievably unimaginably difficult days and we can try and give moral support. Ruti, Ruti Amal, you've been deeply involved in this and I want to give you the last word. Thank you, Robert Jonathan. I want to say three things and I will start with the unexpected one because I want to start with what's going on in Russia. So uh, two days ago, the parliament passed the law up to 15 years of jail for fake news about special operation in Ukraine. They start stopping people and checking what's on their phones. If you check the protests of today, four and a half thousand people are being arrested. Just type protests in Russia and look at the photo pictures. My friend told me every day there are 35 flights to Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, and they're full. People are fleeing. People are scared of the tyranny that is going and repression going to happen. So whilst we're preparing for refugees for Ukraine, please be prepared for refugees from Russia. Second, I was checking today if I can bring my family who is fleeing high as we speak and drive into the border of, uh, of Ukraine to leave. And no, I can't because they're my cousins. So they only can see their family. So I feel ashamed. And then when I asked my friends in Ukraine, which help do you need? And they said, look, Lots of money being invested, a lot of support for refugees we are being sent weapons. Please close the sky. Please, please close the sky above our country because this is our weakest point and that's where they get us. So please, if you can put pressure on politicians and representatives in the parliament, in the government, close the sky. That's what's needed most. Thank you. And World Jewish Relief also asked us right to IMPs for strong action wish everybody every strength and for all of us to do whatever we can and i'll take those lines history is made of personal choices and the moment is now a big thank you to stand for ukraine to jonathan friedland to Hagai siegel to rabbi shoshana boyd gelfand to riti amal thank you thank you to everybody for participating